my card. <laughs> Thank yes, you. thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction, warm welcome, and it's been amazing being with Strategia Netherlands doing this work, uh, especially because uh, M&E professionals or development sector NGOs will need a lot of equipping uh, because this is an industry that is changing very fast very dynamic and therefore I appreciate this uh, opportunity to just share with you my little contribution on uh, research methods. So I'd now like to begin my presentation. And just as uh, Mr. John Caregua has mentioned, I am a consultant clinical psychologist and research mentor. I'm currently consulting for several organizations, Ida Africa in Kenya and Author Aid in the UK over 320,000 researchers online and offline and doing lots of trainings in research. And in research mentorship, we know that when we come together, we can reflect and learn and grow. So I'm not an expert in everything. We are going to be growing and learning together. This um, topic of today is research methods for M&E professionals. I recognize that some of us may not be in the field of monitoring and evaluation. So, so I have infused some facts just to distinguish what is the difference between research and evaluation. And then obviously I will dwell more on research methods as applicable to monitoring and evaluation professionals. I do project evaluation work in the fields of mental health and psychosocial support, MHPSS, as well as research. Uh, and research training programs. And so my program and project evaluation work is actually connected to a lot of the consultancies I'm doing in research training and in psychology. So I've obviously, I've already acknowledged uh, Strategia Netherlands. This is probably the poster you saw as you came into the webinar today. So I'd like to just take some sharing uh, in the chat. Uh, what is research? Uh, according to a few people, I'd just like to see what a uh, few people would tell me uh, what research is. Let's make this highly interactive. I see lots of introductions still coming in, uh, but what is research? Just answering the first question, what is research? According to you, wow, they are even raised hands, but because of time, just type it in the chat. <laughs> I won't take the sharing in the videos. Right now, it's an inquiry, finding new information. We are over 300 participants in the Zoom room. Please bear with me, <laughs> but maybe we'll take some more sharing later. I see it is a scientific method. Wow, wonderful. Yeah, searching for truth. I like that one. Um, finding answers to scientific questions. Uh, it is a methodological inquiry, collection of data and information to inform decision making really well done. I think this is a good crowd. I think I'm in the right place, systemic, systematic data collection to answer important questions, analyzing the problem and finding root causes, searching new knowledge, gathering data. You are all right. Answering questions, systematic investigation. In fact, um, all of you are right. And somebody asked, will the slides be shared? <laughs> Proofing a hypothesis, a systematic investigation. I think we are all in the right place. Curiosity, yes. The quest for an answer, yes. That is actually all on point. I have not seen any answer that is off, actually. Uh, very well done. So we'll look at that and then obviously compare research versus M&D. Then when we talk about methods and methodology, are they the same thing? We will talk about that. Then sometimes you'll hear quantitative and qualitative. And if you're an M and E professional, you probably come across that. And uh, if you're not, um, if you're a researcher, you're probably even more familiar with that. And then how do you choose a methodology to inform the methods? And then sample research questions, examples of research methods, some common pitfalls, ethical considerations, and then just a summary of some top tips if you would like to know how to use research in m and &E. So that's what we are going to cover uh, in this very brief webinar. <laughs> so you've probably seen uh, this diagram of the steps for research. Yes, a lot of you talked about identification of a problem. So we know that in, in, in a stepwise approach, we can say research is about identifying a problem, then developing a research plan and conducting the research, actually going ahead to do the research and then analyzing and reporting findings and then taking action. 
uh, when you disseminate the research, you can actually now at that point also talk about evaluation, like you can see uh, there at the very bottom of the slide. So what is research? So a lot of you, most of you, all of you got it. It is in common language, in common parlance, a search for knowledge. So it is a systematic means of problem solving, the art of scientific investigation. So in other words, it's the scientific and systematic search for pertinent information on a specific topic. A lot of mainstream research is quantitative, but now we've also seen the foray or the entry of qualitative research as well into um, mainstream research. And so we can also talk about uh, quantitative, qualitative, mixed methods. We'll know what that is uh, going along. But in most cases, when we talk about research, there are some key characteristics. It's got to be systematic. It is a process. I have just shown you the steps that we talk about when we say we do research. It is logical. You're either using induction or deduction. So deduction, whereby you can generalize, and induction, where you can move from general to specific in your logic. Then empirical, it is evidence-based. Um, we need some very observable evidence. It is reductive or generalizable. This is mostly applied to quantitative research, not qualitative research, which is why I say we will get to know the differences shortly. Then it is replicable. In most cases, your methodology should be able to be replicated or repeated by somebody else in another part of the world. So is research and evaluation mutually independent? Uh, according to this diagram, yes, it is. So it seems like there are some commonalities, but there is some distinctions too. As you can see on the right, evaluation can exist on its own, and on the left, research can exist on its own. But in the middle, there are some places where it actually meets. And then we can also talk about evaluation as a subset of research. Now, I'm not going to go into all the philosophical debates, just going to dwell very briefly on distinguishing the two. This is especially for those of us joining the webinar today who may not be M&E professional. So what is the difference between research and M&E? Research on the one hand is the systematic collection, analysis and interpretation of data with the purpose of describing, explaining, predicting research phenomena. When we talk about social research, I'm a social scientist, we're talking about logic through observation and the interaction between ideas and evidence. But evaluation, on the other hand, is whereby you use findings which are concerned with phenomena, which are not generalized beyond their application to a given product and program. So evaluation of a particular program can provide very useful information about that program. The information may not apply to another program. So you see how it can be quite specific when we talk about evaluation. A few more differences. Uh, we've already seen these answers. You all got them right. Research exists to satisfy curiosity, advance new knowledge, make meaning out of evidence, and use such evidence to test extend or revise existing knowledge of facts. Research, there are so many goals for research, but it is used to create or validate theories through data collection and analysis. So we can talk about the goals of research as exploration, description, prediction, control, and explanation of phenomena. So you see, this is a very distinct goal for research that's different from evaluation. In evaluation, the goal is to contribute to the solution of practical problems through analyzing the value of whatever is evaluated, right? So research is about finding answers while M&D is focused on a development intervention or set of interventions. Research is almost always designed to generate new knowledge or understanding, but M&E is concerned with issues such as project or program management or compliance. Research is concerned with the relationship between two or more variables, especially when we begin to talk about quantitative research, but evaluation describes the objects of evaluation. Research seeks conclusions while evaluation leads to decisions. Research sets its own problems, but most of the time you'll find that evaluation is commissioned by a client, all right? So now we go to the second, part of the presentation. What's the difference between research methodology and research method? And again, I'd just like to take a 
little brief sharing in the chat. Please not uh, raising hands, but just typing in the chat because we have a big number of participants. What's the difference between methodology and method according to you? A lot of people asking about the presentation. I believe that will be available. I'll be happy to uh, share that with you as well. And obviously you'll get the video recording. So I'm still waiting to get from you. What's the difference between methodology and method? And the slide on this screen hopefully gives you a hint <clears throat> on the difference between methodology and method. So the methods are what and how. Oh, interesting. Okay. <laughs> The process to get information, methodology is broader, methodology is a set of methods, it's all the steps followed, methodology is what you use to get your answer, okay, so that's a bit different from somebody else who said what and how, okay, <clears throat> so methodology is the process, uh -huh. methodology is what and how and why. Oh, interesting. And somebody said the set of tools used. Are you talking about methods or methodology in that case? Methodology is approaches and techniques. It's the overarching paradigm. Methods is details of how to go about it. Okay, so methodology is a study of methods and methods is more specific. Interesting. Methodology has philosophical approaches. So many wonderful answers here. <laughs> I like this group. Uh, method is a tool you use. Okay, uh, answering WH questions of your study. So when you say the answer, tell us if you're, if you're talking about methods or methodology. So which one are you talking about? Method is what you use to get, okay, to get maybe your research findings. Okay, it's tools, okay. Methodology focuses on approaches while method implies steps and procedures, okay. Method is the specific approach to answer your questions. So interesting um, that you all have different uh, ways to put it, but we are going to see shortly um, if any of you got it right. I think most of you did. <laughs> so here you can see in the diagram, some arrows going into the very center of this um, uh, rectangles. And from the broadest approach, we talk about research approach. And then we talk about methodology and then method and then procedure and then technique. So if I ask you which research method um, do you know, and then maybe you will tell me a research methodology, um, then I'll begin to distinguish that the two sometimes can be used synonymously, but they are exact, they are different. So let's distinguish the two. Let's just find out what is the difference between these two, methodology and method. So methodology is the beginning, while method is the end of any scientific or non-scientific research. Methodology is the technique or how to conduct research, while the method is what you use, you know, to conduct research. So methodology is the study about the tools of research. It's broader. Somebody talked about being, it being broader. And it explains the methods by which you may proceed with your research. So there is a distinction and there is a difference. So you can see that method is the actual tools or steps taken by which you conduct research into a subject or a topic. So we talk about types of methodology. Remember methodology is broader. We can talk about the general category. I've, I've already alluded to quantitative and qualitative. And most of you know what that is and we will see what it is. Then you can talk about the nature of the study. Is it a descriptive research or analytical research? You know, then you can talk about the purpose of the study. And I think this is important to highlight. Is it applied or fundamental research? In many cases, M and E professionals will work alongside researchers who have taken lots of time to do a lot of work on data. And so it's good to have these distinctions and have a general idea of what you know research entails, because evaluation being a specific act of going into checking the outcomes of projects and programs, uh, it's good to know what, when we say applied research or fundamental research or basic research, what are we talking about? Okay, so those are some examples of purpose. Then of course, research design, which is again broader, we can talk about exploratory or conclusive, and then data types. Uh, when we say primary research, it is research that is actually collected in the field. Uh, this is 
with direct uh, uh, research that you get directly. Secondary research, uh, research that you will get maybe from reading um, literature that's already existing. It's also called existing uh, data. So is this data type primary or secondary? All these wordings are just to jog your mind on research methodology, which is a broader aim. Today's topic is on research methods. And again, this is a very popular diagram. It's called the research onion. Uh, it describes how all of these methodologies and um, methods are related. So you can see from uh, the broadest uh, concentric of all these philosophies, positivism, realism, interpretivism, pragmatism, these are wild views. I'm not going to go into that because today's webinar is not focused on that, just to help people understand where do methods come from? They come from philosophies. And then we have approaches, didactive and inductive, and I'd already alluded to that. Then now we can talk about strategies and some people will call these methods. For example, case study is a method. It is used mostly in qualitative types of research. Um, and so you'll see, as I said earlier, some of these words are synonymous, strategies, methods. And then we have choices of how to go about your research. Is it mixed methods, mono method, multi method? When we say mixed methods, we basically just mean combining qualitative and quantitative. And we are going to know the difference uh, coming up shortly. Then obviously the time horizon. Are you talking about longitudinal study, which takes you know, uh, uh, some time or cross-sectional, which is actually a cross-section of time. And then obviously techniques and procedures, data collection, data analysis. Um, we could go on and on and, and begin to talk about um, each one of these, but today I will just stick to uh, methods uh, in research. So as I said uh, in summary, methodology is a rationale behind your research. It's the lens through which you analyze results. It's really essentially the question of how. How do you answer your research question? So obviously from the research onion diagram earlier, you could see some philosophies like phenomenology, which is about lived experiences. When we talk about ethnography, it's about culture, social norms, group behavior, action research, you know, looking systematically at a problem and trying to get various solutions pragmatically, you know, uh, whichever is effective, you go with it. And then methods, we talk about what you do to collect data. This is the focus of today's uh, training. Um, for example, we have surveys, questionnaires, focus group, case study is a method, structured interviews and controlled experiment. So that is the uh, distinction between methodology and methods. Now, um, how about qualitative and quantitative? When we talk about qualitative, we are talking about using pictures, words, sentences, paragraphs, narrations, and short stories. A lot of you in M and E will actually apply uh, qualitative research in analyzing loads and loads of uh, evidence that is actually in textual format. And then when we talk about quantitative research, we're talking about uh, lots of data that's numerical in nature, numbers, scales, hypotheses, calculations, and statistical tools. So we say that, um, for instance, uh, in quantitative research, we will have a hypothesis to test, all right? While in qualitative research, we are actually generating a new theory based on all the gathered data that is mostly textual in nature. Then as you can see right in the middle, mixed research exists where you can actually use both text and uh, numerical data in analyzing an interpretation of data. You can use both inductive and deductive methods of presenting data. So um, out of this um, research designs, quantitative and qualitative, many methods come about. So you'll find uh, experiments, correlational research, survey, grounded theory, uh, ethnographic, narrative. There's so many different types of methods coming out of the design. Some people ask, what's the connection between designs and methods? Designs are just a way of thinking about strategies to collect data. And when you combine them, you can get a few others, such as action research. 
So again, I'm not going to dwell so much into this, but where, where does it all begin? It begins with choosing a methodology. So you, you start with your research question. What kinds of data would help answer your question? And how would you want to present your results? For instance, if you are thinking about um, a question that would re require frequencies, then that would be mostly quantitative research. And if you have a question that has a lot of narrations and stories, that's mostly qualitative research. So you'll find that the basic element of analysis distinguishes uh, what kind of research methodology you pick and therefore which methods you use. So here are some sample questions. I have two sets and you will tell me whether you think these are quantitative or qualitative. So I'm going to see if you've been listening so far. <laughs> so what are Kenyan university students' experiences trying to eat healthy on campus? Is that quantitative, qualitative? What do you think? How can expressive writing improve the mental health of incarcerated women in Nairobi? What are African secondary school students' perceptions about gender differences in mathematics intelligence? Note the words in each question, experiences, how, and perception. Do you think this is quantitative or qualitative? Let's take some sharing in the chat. All these three are actually qualitative. Yes, you got that right. Somebody said quantitative for the first one and qualitative for the other two. Wow, but most of you said all of them are qualitative. And I think <laughs> most majority uh, wins. You know, we say in democracy, democracy is the tyranny of the majority. Somebody said quantitative, qualitative and quantitative. Oh, wow, okay. I think that all of them are qualitative. If you have an, uh, another different answer, that's uh, different from that, please explain. Uh, somebody says the last one could be a mixed method. Okay, I see what you mean, yeah. Sometimes a, a research question can reveal both quantitative and qualitative aims. So I, I get that, yeah, I get that. That, that is actually accurate. Um, somebody says explain, please, all right. So as I said earlier, uh, we talked about the unit of analysis of qualitative being words and narrative but quantitative being uh, figures. I think the person asking me to explain will get it if we go to the next set. So that was set one. How about set two? How regularly do Kenyan online postgraduate students use optional academic support services? How regularly? That is the operative word in that question. Do you think this is quantitative or qualitative? What is the difference in daily calories intake between men and women in Accra? Is that quantitative or qualitative? And then what is the relationship between job satisfaction and salary among expatriate workers? Let's see, let's take some sharing for the set two. A lot of people saying quantitative, all of them are quantitative. I haven't seen a different answer. Yeah, somebody even explained it's because it's about frequency. Yes, very well said, thank you. All three are quantitative. This one seemed more straightforward. Okay, I haven't seen any, any okay, somebody said one, two is quantitative, but three is mixed. Okay, somebody said the whole of set two is quantitative because of the frequency aspect. And the person who said mixed, let's see, yes, it is possible that that one can also be a mixed method because when you talk about relationship between, you can be talking about a statistical correlation that is a quantitative type of a research question. And you can also be talking about uh, differences in, um, these experiences, okay? So that, that question can also incorporate a mixed methods approach. So I think all of you are right. This is the beauty with adult learning, nobody is wrong. <laughs> so here are some examples of research methods. Now we are really in the meat of this presentation today. Uh, quantitative um, research methods involve survey, 
had already mentioned that. And what is that survey? It's the collection of primary data using a structured questionnaire. I'm sure you've all seen a survey, uh, at least because you've all been in academic uh, situations. And then statistical analysis of people's health data. That's also a quantitative method. Uh, you can take even a secondary data set and do a statistical analysis of it. Uh, comparison between two data sets, uh, that is actually quantitative. And then, uh, you know, with that comparison, you can see figures and trends and patterns. And then obviously analysis of population trends. There's a lot of big data that's actually quantitative. Then when we talk about qualitative methods, we talk about in-depth interviews, um, focus group discussions, case study, observation, textual analysis. Those are some examples of qualitative research methods. So when we talk about um, quantitative methods, you can also have a hybrid method. Any two research methods that are combined to gain information regarding the problem under study. So you may find that you can combine, for instance, um, you know, um, a questionnaire, with maybe uh, personal interviews. So you can have something emailed to someone and you can also have a telephone survey as well. Then qualitative methods. Um, focus group, um, just to explain, is a discussion with an expert moderator in a natural manner, you know, with a small group of respondents and each of the sentiments um, and elicited by each respondent is carefully recorded and analyzed. This uh, focus group discussion data is actually usually transcribed, you know, in order to be analyzed using qualitative approaches. Then, of course, photo ethnography, you can use photos. You take clicks of pictures and you're able to understand uh, various situations, phenomena, stories, and things like that. So, of course, um, a psychologist, I just had to add one more there, which has psychology on it. <laughs> In psychology, we do lots of uh, mainstream, what they call mainstream research laboratory experiment, but majority are actually field experiments. So uh, we do lots of natural experiments and quasi experiments. Those are just examples of methods. And so uh, just as I finish some common pitfalls, you'll find that in quantitative methods, a lot of times you have to be very careful and check your equipment or recording device. It can fail. Uh, this could also happen in qualitative. I just them like that, but it could happen either way. Then obviously environmental hazards, because if you're taking uh, maybe a survey with a large number of respondents, and maybe you're in a humanitarian setting, maybe after an earthquake, all these distractions can affect the respondents and make data interpretation difficult. So you've got to think about that. And then when you're transcribing for both quantitative and qualitative, this apply. Um, you have to be very careful for misinterpretation, colloquialism, jargon, slang, you know, and things like that. And then in qualitative, usually not asking enough people or not stating um, that your findings are maybe only applicable to a certain number of people. So it's very important when you report qualitative findings to just give background information and give the demographics of the people who actually um, responded. And then when you take raw data and treat it like uh, validated uh, statistics after analysis, uh, in qualitative, we even don't talk about statistics much. We talk about you know information that has been processed from raw data. You've got to be very careful uh, when you take verbal excerpts and now you do a thematic analysis and you come up with themes, these have got to look different. They've got to be distinguished. And then when you use uh, open-ended questions and maybe do not use um, proper content analysis, and therefore it, it is difficult to actually analyze the data. And poorly designed surveys, this applies to both quantitative and qualitative. If the survey is biased, confusing, or unclear, it may not even account for all the possible answers. That's a problem. So you've got to look out for those. And just quickly, ethical considerations when thinking about methods, design, think about participant vulnerability. So if you're supposed to uh, design a study and think about some methods, especially if you're a M and E professional, you've got to think about uh, how can we safeguard the participants uh, in that project or in that uh, research in order that um, you know they are safe and they are giving information that they have 
given consent for. Then think about the nature of the topic. I had alluded to that earlier when you talk about, um, you know, maybe topics that are illegal <laughs> or unethical. Uh, for instance, in many countries, abortion is uh, illegal. So think about ethical concerns as you're going about your research methods. And then consent, you've got to have permission prior to collecting data. So confidentiality, anonymity, you ensure that there is no name written on any of the research uh, survey packs so that um, people remain anonymous and their data is, used, is stored privately and confidentially. Then think about you know, the method for collecting data and whether that could bring any conflict of interest. For example, a lot of people who are uh, not literate uh, would not want you to give them you know, a paper and a pen to fill in. You'd rather switch to you know, face to face as a method. And then researcher vulnerability. Uh, it's always important to also think about the safety of researchers. During COVID time, a lot of our researchers were vulnerable because they were in high risk situations. Uh, so think about that. In summary, the goal of research is to make sense of data and relate it back to your research question and how it addresses a gap in literature. So when we do research as M&D professionals, we've got to be flexible in gathering information and interpreting data. You can't say, oh, I'm only used to doing this method. I can't change. Be flexible. And then always remember to obtain permission before you access data so that you can be able to use it freely. And then check that your analysis hasn't been done and reported elsewhere. It's always good to check for plagiarism and also knowing the rules of writing so that um, at least your work is original. And then getting ethical approval before collecting data is very important. Then your analysis is crucial. Avoid reporting all the data. You actually need to seed the data and pick the main points. So that was just my um, uh, contribution. And there are some resources, very short YouTube videos. Some of them are animated, which is great especially for the non-M and E professionals in order for you to understand the differences between research and M and E and a few more um, videos on methods. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take any comments or questions. Thank you very much, uh, Joyce. That is uh, quite uh, illuminating. Um, at this stage, let's uh, open the floor for questions. Um, we need to see, Regina, can you display the people raising their hands so we can uh, call them? Uh, thank you. We need to see who has a question. Regina, please display people's faces so we can see them and so they can raise their hands. Um, Okay. Yes, everybody is saying this is a beautiful presentation. Thank you very much, Joyce. I can say thank you for informative presentation. Uh huh. Um, very well articulated. Thank you. Amazing presentation. Thank you. Um, please display people's faces so we can see them uh, as they raise their hands. Can you do that? They can open videos. Yeah. You can yes. open their videos. Yes, open their videos, please. Yes. So we can, uh, I can moderate the question and answer session. Please display the videos. Good presentation. Thank you very much. Um, very much appreciative, very informative session. Thank you. Um, um, people asking if they can get a copy of that presentation. Please display the videos. Otherwise, we have to figure out how to uh, take questions. Amazing session. Thank you. Very good presentation. Do you have questions really? Wow, that's amazing presentation. Thank you, Joyce. I can see the compliments. God. I have enabled the video so the participant can open their videos when they have questions. Okay. The only I cannot we cannot I cannot see the faces. Joyce, can you see the participants? Um, no, I cannot, but I can actually see some questions uh, in the chat. Can I take some or? 
Okay, fine. I was hoping uh, we would get to hear people contribute uh, themselves in person. Uh, that makes, uh, uh, but it's okay. Then take the questions uh, from the chat. I think there's some technical issue here. Right. Uh, so I'm seeing um, a lot of questions about sharing the, the presentation that I think you will address. Yes. And then um, quite a number asking about, somebody asked about how or where do you get ethical approval? Another one asked, I'm trying to lump them because they're, similar another okay. one asked if you're doing an environmental research do you need ethical approval that's a really good question um so in kenya there are three levels of approval at your institution if you are a, if you're doing research um there are institutions that have institutional review boards that give uh, approval for research and then at the national level uh you also have to get from the government um nakosti approval and then also at the county level if you have county level data you've got to get permissions there so um uh, depending on which country you're coming from you've got to check with your jurisdiction and then for environmental research if research involves uh any living beings uh even if it's an environmental research for example um humans plants and animals then you do need research approval bioethics bio is about life so you get um, approval if it has uh, the entity on research is actually a living being. I think that's a question that's a bit outside the topic, but that's okay. That's fine. Then I have other questions here that are, I think in the topic. How do you use textual analysis as a method of qualitative data collection? Really good question. How also the difference that can case study be used in both qualitative and quantitative? Really wonderful questions here about uh, research methods, which was today's topic. Uh, research is a very wide field. We can't cover everything. But yes, um, how do we use textual analysis? Content and thematic analysis can be done on uh, text. And you can, for instance, think about the work that journalists do. They analyze a lot of text and then they come up with, you know, um, you know, qualitative uh, findings out of that. And then um, can case study be used in both qualitative and quantitative? I think the answer is yes. Now, as I said earlier, some of the words are used synonymously. Case study is also a strategy, not just a method. So you can find collective case study as a qualitative approach. And in quantitative uh, strategies, you can also find case study there. It's only that the difference is that you will find a lot of um, numerical statistics in the quantitative and in collective case study in qualitative you'll find the experiences of a unique group of people I hope that answers you somebody asked me to uh, use my own experience to differentiate research and evaluation brilliant question so in my experience I have done lots and lots of evaluation where I'm swinging into a project to check whether the outcomes are actually being achieved and in that case, I am doing an evaluation. But in the case where I just want out of curiosity to know something, that is research. So I hope that answers you. And in my uh, entire career, I do research, I do psychology consultancy, and you'll find that when I'm doing research, I just want to know something. <laughs> I am not concerned with any particular uh, information for a program. But when I'm doing evaluation, I will be actually looking at how effective is, for example, drug rehabilitation for people who want to quit uh, alcohol. So that's the example that I can give. I hope you can uh, relate to that. And so in that case, I'll enter a program and look at all the program components and the log frame, which is the logical framework, the indicators, the uh, inputs, the outputs, the outcomes, and therefore I'll be able to come up with a report that is an evaluation report. Of course, I use some research strategies as I'm doing that evaluation, so I hope uh, that answers you. So let's see, there's so many more questions coming in. They always uh, multiply like this. <laughs> <laughs> How do we consciously include gender consideration in research methodology and methods? Okay, then I'll take also uh, the difference between mixed methods and multi-methods. That's interesting. So how do we include gender um, in research methodology and methods, uh, especially when beginning to design methodologies, we've got to think about um, 
what is a representative sample? If your <clears throat> study is on a particular gender, then you go all in for that gender. But if you want a representative sample, for instance, my doctorate study um, indicated that there are slightly more males than females who actually have deafness and use sign language, slightly more males than females in any population, about 55 to 45% ratio. So then the gender consideration was to make sure even in my sample, I have an equitable number of males and females in order that that is actually representative. And so when we go about thinking about your methods, you can think about uh, gender sensitive um, ways of collecting data. I hope that answers you. Mixed and multi-methods research, that is quite interesting. Um, we do have mixed methods research, which is actually a combination of both uh, qualitative and quantitative. And then we have multi-methods, which is just the, um, it is just the use of different uh, approaches, okay, which are not combined. And there's an entirely different uh, presentation that we can create on that. I'm not going to give any more information on that. What I can do is just share a previous uh, uh, um, presentation I did on mixed methods that will uh, hopefully enlighten you on that one. So um, each of these questions can be potentially its own webinar. <laughs> so, okay, let's see if we can uh, lump uh, up the questions that are similar so that, um, yeah, we proceed. I see somebody asking how to contact me. Uh, do you give certification? I think there are some questions that are for you, <laughs> Mr. Carrega. Uh, the difference between research and evaluation, I've already explained that in practice. Um, I'm just trying to see which uh, question I have not answered. How is data protection law relevant for researchers? That's a really important question. In Kenya, we just had a um, new law on data protection, and we've got to be very careful to safeguard information that we collect in research. Remember when you collect information, it's got to be both private and confidential, and it's got to be stored for a certain amount of time. And it's got to be de-identified, meaning that the identification details are separated from the data. So data protection law is very relevant because it assists researchers not to be in the wrong books with the law, but also to ultimately protect the research participant. Sometimes you may not have identification details, you know, in your data, but because, you know, it's very easy for someone to piece together evidence and connect it to someone, it can be used against them. So that's the reason why data protection law has to be adhered to, and it's very important for researchers to look into that. Then um, what is the best way to use participatory methods? methodology for evaluation of cash transfer programs, considering GBV? It's a really interesting question. I would say for cash transfer programs, uh, there's been a lot of, uh, as we know, money uh, can be said to be a construct that can be deconstructed, especially using qualitative methods. We know that uh, money and power are related. And so gender-based violence, occurs a lot of times when we have, you know, um, money differences in the households, especially between husbands and wives. And so using participatory methodology to evaluate that, I think you'd have to make sure that you have trauma-informed uh, evaluation approaches. A lot of times if I'm going in to evaluate and I want to speak to the wives, they tell me, oh no, we can't speak to you because our husbands have not given us permission. So you've got to be very creative and innovative if you've got to ask the wives if they are receiving money from the government and not telling their husbands, or you are going to be asking the husbands if they are receiving money from the government and not telling their wives. You've got to really come up with out of the box strategies for uh, this uh, evaluation to be safe and that even after you leave that uh, situation or that scene, that there will not be any negative outcome or repercussion or consequence after your evaluation is over. So you've got to think ahead of even after when you finish. So thinking outside the box will help with that. 
Could you please clarify about theory of change? I'll not go into that. <laughs> That's an evaluation uh, question. What is intersectional research approach? We have quite a number of questions here that um, maybe uh, we need another webinar. <laughs> Uh, a difference between how you package research as compared to an evaluation. I think I went in depth with that. I'm not sure if you were there, but uh, basically we talked about evaluation being very specific, research having broader aims. Okay. So is there any unanswered question? I should have been ticking as I answered them. <laughs> so many different um, questions. Can methods be used as a tool for obtaining data? Yes, yes, I think we say that methodology. Yes, a lot of people saying yes, their questions is answered. I'm trying to see which one is not yet answered. <laughs> Lots of wonderful uh, interaction here and maybe we'll need a different webinar for, for different uh, questions. Okay, so I don't know if you can see any other question uh, on your side. Um, John, I'm trying to check. Okay, yeah, somebody moved it to the chat. What is impact evaluation? Wow. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. More questions coming in. Any other questions? Some people are raising hands. I don't know if we can take that. Yes, I think. Uh, yes, let's take. Um, let's see whose hands are up. Yeah. And impact evaluation uh, assesses the changes that can be attributed to an intervention. I've done some impact evaluation training and uh, it's basically helps with the decision-making in a project, in a program or a policy, you know, the intended uh, changes and the unintended ones. So we are always checking to see control group, experimental group, which one was intended and which one was unintended. So it's basically just an assessment of how the intervention is being evaluated, okay? So I, I think we have in questions, some of them are broader, some are outside the topic. I'm, I'm, I'm being gracious and I can also say that it is also an opportunity for future webinars. <laughs> I think take questions for people whose hands are up. Maybe they want to speak. Okay. I can't, yeah. Are you able to, yeah, are you able to select or I can check? I'm not able to. If you um, can uh, pick someone and then you unmute them to ask questions. Okay, let me see. Um, Aha, Dr. Nigusi. Yes, I can see Dr. Nigusi, yes. Yeah, welcome. Okay, I've sent you the prompt to unmute. Um. Must unmute. Uh, Regina, please unmute Dr. Nigusi. Okay. Uh, Barry Ham. I'm not sure if his question was already answered. His um, hand is still up. Okay. Otherwise, we could try somebody else. This one, gentlemen. Loud Marte. Let's try Loud Marte and see if that works. Yes, Loud, welcome. I've sent you the prompt. Yes. Hmm. I'm not sure how it works, but I've sent the prompt for him to unmute. <laughs> Try someone else. Okay, Simon Muyaloka, welcome. Can you unmute? Yes, welcome, Simon. Uh, yeah, it works. Oh, so <laughs> hi, Doc, and hi, everyone. Hello. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to, to maybe join on time. I was thinking that uh, this this webinar was going to start at uh, twelve p.m., so I'm 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 actually responding from Zambia. Oh, I see. Yes, please. Uh, so uh, my my question is basically, I, I wanted to find out, uh, what 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 evaluation method would you use for take for instance, uh, 
uh, a, a behavioral intervention and maybe how, how best would you really know that mm. uh, this intervention that we've had mm -hmm. is, is basically as a result out of this intervention. Uh, maybe let me, let, me, let me give an example. You'd find that uh, you're you are in a community where yeah. you might say uh, beer drinking is, is, is so much. Yeah. And uh, you, you, you'd want to come up with this intervention to reduce the uptake of beer in this community. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, but at the end of the day, you find that uh, your, your, your expected results are achieved. But yeah. you may find that in that particular area, mm -hmm. there are also churches that are in that particular place. So you, you don't really point out to say uh, this intervention really was as a result of, I mean, this outcome was as a result of this intervention yeah. that you had actually implemented. So how, how best do you marry? Yeah. How best do you marry the two, knowing that your your outcome maybe was not really based on the intervention, but maybe yeah. there are other confounders which yeah. made the outcome to be the way it is. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's an evaluation question. And today's topic was on research methods, but I'll quickly just address it. So it is about how do you evaluate behavior change interventions? How do you design and evaluate um, this intervention? So I would say the step approach. I think I, the first slide was the steps. You start with a background, you know, think about um, your problem, what do you want to actually evaluate? And then after you identify the problem, you review the evidence, you know, then you can draw a logic model. Now, this is where we talk evaluation language, and then you monitor your logic model, basically depending on whatever it is you want to check as the change in the outcomes over time, you know, you can do that. Um, let me not go into details about how to do an evaluation. <laughs> because today's topic was on research methods, but that's a brilliant question. Thank you. Okay. So uh, was there somebody else who was to talk? Ahmed, I see you are unmuted. Welcome. Yeah, thank you, Atawangi. Uh, my question is, uh, just in sometimes you may encounter uh, when you are doing research, lack of uh, just like a literate review. So mm -hmm. maybe your, your, topic, your topic does not have enough literature review. So what may you do if and if you meet like that uh, problem? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So you have, uh, you're trying to research on something, but there's actually not enough literature. So you have inadequate literature. What do you do? Yeah. It's a very typical problem. It's, it's almost like the one we call the, the egg and the hen, which came first, you know? <laughs> You're trying to research, but there's actually not enough literature. So where do you get ideas to reference in order to build your, you know, your theoretical case and things like that? Most of the time, and I encountered this during my doctoral research because my research was on people with disabilities and there wasn't enough research. Uh, in my specific area, uh, what you do is you will pull from other regions and you'll find that you can still create a reference list, including not just from, for example, my region of Sub-Saharan Africa, I pulled from other regions of the world, but I also pulled from other disciplines, okay? So for your literature to be built up, if you don't have enough literature in your field for your research, you can actually get from other fields, other disciplines. You don't have to stick with just the one you're studying. I hope that helps to answer that. Let's see who else um, hand it up. Ahmed, I hope yeah, I've answered. Thank you. Thank you okay, for your answering well, that question. Thank okay, you. you can, thanks. You can lower your hand. Um, let's take Agnes. She's trying to get some gender balance here. <laughs> Agnes, welcome. Please unmute Agnes, Joyce, uh, Regina. Okay. I have sent a request for how to unmute. Wonderful, thank you. Agnes, can you hear us? Shall we try somebody else? Uh, 
Okay, let's try Janet. Janet, welcome. Hello, thank you. And thank you for the presentation. My question is um, with the second batch of questions that were mainly quantitative, is it possible to include um, qualitative to it so that you can learn why the frequencies are coming up? Is that okay? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. So this questions the set two can be modified actually to become mixed methods and you'll find traditionally that many quantitative researchers include qualitative research as a way to confirm the findings so phase one of your project maybe you do a quantitative uh, study and you find some uh, statistical patterns and it's interesting and then you do a qualitative um, study to get the experiences in-depth descriptions and uh, and rich rich descriptions of why this phenomenon looks like this in the in the quantitative side. So that's a brilliant question. Yes, it is possible to actually include them. So what you would need to do is just modify the question for it to have a mixed methods approach. Remember, we say that your uh, research questions reflect very much if uh, you're doing a quantitative or a qualitative type of a study. Thank you. I hope I've answered you. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, you have. Wonderful. So um, anybody else? Um, Agnes, we are back to you. If you want to still ask. If your questions have been answered, you can lower your hand. <laughs> still have more people whose hands are raised. Okay, let's try Kelvin. Welcome, Kelvin Kalungi. And then we'll go to Lavina after that. Kelvin, you've got the prompt to unmute. Okay, Lavina. Okay, I'm not sure if uh, Lavina has lowered her hand. Okay, Kelvin. All right, let's try somebody else. Hassan, Osman. Welcome, Hassan. Okay, Kelvin is unmuted now. <laughs> Welcome. Well, just a question. Thank you for the good uh, presentation that you have just given unto us. We really appreciate. So um, I'm from Kenya and uh, I wanted just to ask uh, maybe about the key informant interviews. There are those uh, key informant interviews that we are used to doing uh, in, uh, let's say, the, the big organizations or with uh, the key stakeholders. So maybe uh, is it included in the quantitative or in the qualitative part of the interviews? Yeah, these are qualitative IDIs. They are in-depth interviews with people who know what is going on. And usually when we do key informant interviews, what we want to do is to collect information from a wide range of people for their opinions. People with first hand knowledge. The reason they're called key is people with first hand knowledge. And typically, when you do a qualitative uh, approach, you actually want to start analyzing from the person with the most information. Okay. So uh, you can conduct key informant interviews with different people. And obviously, we know that key informant interviews are experts. Okay, so researchers only use key informant interviews when they can secure a participant with unique knowledge of a topic. But in-depth interviews can be with anyone. So we talk about KIIs, the key informant interviews, have a very good point and I'll add it in my slides. And then we talk about IDIs, which are in-depth interviews. So a key informant interview is a type of an in-depth interview, but why is it called key? It's because these are actually experts. So we want to have people like community leaders, professionals, residents, you know, people who are actually on the ground, you know. So thank you for that question. Have I answered you? I hope I've answered you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, let's go to Hodan Hussein. 
please unmute. Then Dr. Sandra Elden Howie next. Yeah, welcome. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yes. Yes. Hi, welcome. how are you? I'm good. Yeah, I'm calling from East Africa, Somaliland. Okay. And nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So I'm trying uh, to write a research uh -huh. about uh, malnutrition in the region. Okay. So sometimes I face a uh, lack of resources. Yeah. So what you should do if you have the idea and yeah. you start it, but you don't have uh, enough resources. Right. For uh, reference techniques and so on. Am I going to depend on Google? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Google, uh, what do you call it? Um, yeah, Google, Google, uh, Scholar. Google, Google Scholar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Am I going mm -hmm. to depend on the uh, and references which are too old? Yeah. So I did not know what to do because looking at other That's scholars. That's a really good seen, question. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I have seen a lot of research that have been written before. Yes. They, they always have uh, updated journals yes. and updated resources. Yeah. So here in Somalia, sometimes we face lack of resources. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually all across the global south. I think you have raised a pertinent question again. It's the Thank broader you. question of blue skies. Yeah, yes. no, it's a really good question. Just the yeah. broader question. It's not related to our topic, but I'll answer it very real quick. <laughs> so oh. in, in the global south, we do have very many access challenges to research. So okay. I'd like you to um, um, uh, consider being yes. a member of the larger, you know, uh, research community in the global south which is trying to address these problems i okay. do have some solutions i do have communities i belong to that you can join uh aida africa and i'll just send you the websites of all these thank you, so much. Thank you so much yeah so um author aid will be a place that you can also find a lot of resources that are actually targeted thank for, you so um yeah for um researchers in Africa, Asia, Global South, basically. So yeah. I've just sent you the website for AIDA Africa and then another one for other aid, uh, whereby you do have um, a lot of people coming together and they actually find the solution. They begin to share resources with each other and things yeah. like that, yeah. And so, also yeah. auditor, Some, sometimes you write something that you don't know whether it's acceptable for all people. Right. Sometimes you want someone to see and audit. Exactly, yeah, exactly, so audit, research. review, edit yes. yeah yeah exactly so support, you can get you can get a lot of yeah. yeah i do research mentorship for over 300,000 uh yes. researchers globally and it's amazing that you can get support from a community of peer researchers thank you so, so you're much very welcome to check thank you so out. much thank you you're welcome yeah I think that's an interesting study on malnutrition. I think we should be having thank more. You. Thank yeah. you so much. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Let's see who else. Uh, Abina, had you spoken? Not yet. I'm just trying to see who hasn't spoken and their hands are raised. Uh, okay. Ma Majabin Han. I sent you a prompt to unmute. Okay, I'm not sure who is talking now. Um, let's see. Hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> there hello. you go. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Bugari, for your presentation. Actually, I have a two question. First mm -hmm. one is, for how long do you retain raw data collected, collected during research? And uh -huh. could you more explain about participant vulnerability? Yes. That's a really good question. So, you know, data storage length after research depends uh, on your, um, as I said in Kenya, we now have a new law uh, on data protection. There's even a new office set up. So you've got to check with your, you know, jurisdiction. But generally we talk about a period of uh, at least, you know, uh, six months, uh, depending on the type of data, I'm not sure which, um, you know, I'm not sure which uh, field you are from. And then the second thing I'm not from, I, I'm not from Kenya, I'm from Pakistan. Right. So I think you, you can easily get that information online on how long you should store uh, data and also uh, confirm with your specific field of study because we talk about different types of data. Okay. So um, 
uh, the length of time is actually that is in, in, in research ethics, something you can easily find even from just a Google search. And then on the second question on ensuring uh, that participant vulnerability is considered, you've got to ensure safeguarding. The first rule of thumb in research is do no harm. So whatever you do, just don't harm participants. So if you come and collect data that makes me uh, leaves me feeling uncomfortable or I'm exposed or I'm going to be at risk of violence as soon as you leave, then that then actually does not um, uh, contribute to the wider goal of making research to make the world a better place. So thinking about making the world a better place, you've got to design research in such a way that you account for the vulnerabilities. For example, people who are children who are below the age of adulthood in any jurisdiction are considered vulnerable. People who are pregnant, you know, people who are incarcerated, people in prison, those are vulnerable populations. So you've got to think about that all the time as you're designing your research. If you're doing research with people with disabilities, then you've got to think about what makes them vulnerable. Basically, what is making these people at risk? Does that answer you? Oh, okay. Um, that means similar to the World Bank safeguard policies? Yes, exactly. That's it. Yeah, we're talking about safeguarding when we talk about participant vulnerability. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. All right, please lower your hand. Um, so that I see who has not spoken and would like to speak. Uh, Dr. Nigusi, had you spoken? Okay, I'm not sure who else still has an unanswered question. Uh, Wallace, then George. Welcome, Wallace. The names keep disappearing. Okay, they're back. <laughs> Wallace? Hello. Oh, hello. Hello, Joyce. Yes. Hi, yeah. thank you. Yeah, my name is George Quilasa from Tanzania. Okay. Yeah, I wrote my question in the chat box, but you didn't see it. Okay. But uh, I wanted you to speak more about the uh, periodic research. Okay. About the, about the, about, about the, uh, about the uh, cold section start and longitudinal study. Yes. I really, I really appreciate your Okay. Your thank you. Yeah, thank you. So you have asked a question about uh, cross-sectional versus longitudinal studies. Okay. Yeah. So the main difference is that a cross-sectional study interviews a fresh sample of people each time it is carried out. Okay, but a longitudinal study follows the same sample of people over time. You see the difference? So most people doing academic research will actually do a cross-sectional study because it's easy to just take um, participants at one point in time. If you have to follow people over time, like over the years, uh, that's quite expensive. And, you know, you can see change over time, several points in time, but that's that, that's not a snapshot. That gives you, you know, a longer time to do the study. And so you'll find that in academic research, most of the time we do cross-sectional studies. I hope that answers you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. And then uh, time horizon. I see a lot more answers. Wow, this is a good community because I'm seeing a lot more answers here. Long, longitudinal studies are costly and subject to different conditions. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so is it possible for someone to accompany you on some of your research projects in Kenya so they may observe and learn from you something like a mentorship program? They will take care of their own costs. I have a keen interest in data and information, but I'd like some experience. This was incredibly helpful. Thank you, Anne Mora, for your question. We do actually have a very detailed research mentorship program, and Strategia Netherlands is also doing this work. And so if you would like mentorship in the field of M&E, uh, you should join the, definitely get the contacts to join this program by Strategia Netherlands. And in Kenya, we also, I had already just shared Ada Africa Limited and Author Aid, which you can be able to uh, join. We have both online and offline. So yes, you can have someone actually uh, working with you uh, in your research journey. 
Thank you for that. All right, Wallace. Welcome. And I think I'd like to ask if your hand is raised and your question is answered, please lower your hand. Wallace, are you able to unmute? Hello. Yes, hello. Hello, we can hear you, Wallace. Thank you so much. My name is Waz Hastings Gofat from Malawi. Mm -hmm. I have just I have just a single question, more especially when we are applying quantitative and qualitative data in a research. Okay. Uh, do we analyze it in the same way we did with when we are using only one data, like going to quantitative? I'm not sure on how we can uh, analyze mixed methods. Thank you so much. Thank for you. That. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And that's not uh, directly uh, a question I can answer it full here, but uh, take the analysis of quantitative and qualitative data and combine the presentation that I did on mixed methods research. I see there is a lot of interest in that topic, and maybe that's for a different webinar for me to unpack that, but we usually take, talk, talk about concurrent. You can analyze them all together. I'll just share it again. <laughs> so you can just watch this on your own um, mixed methods research, uh, or you can, you can also analyze it sequentially, okay? So you can analyze it together, or you can analyze one at a time. So that's the kind of analysis we talk about in mixed methods. And I'll not go deeper into that <laughs> today's, was just an overview of the research methods. But if you watch that, you'll be able to get more details. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great, welcome. Dr. Sana, Ellen Howie. Yes, can, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much for this um, it's, uh, webinar. It's beautiful, thank you. Uh, I am a researcher and a freelance consultant in monitoring and evaluation. Uh, what uh, I'm just want to just say something about the last question, which is uh, how to analyze the quantitative and qualitative data and yeah. to be combined. Uh, yeah. In my, my experience, uh, I have both in all my evaluation uh, assignments. I do the KII focus group discussions, observations, and even remotely and also uh, which is face to face. But what I mean uh, the main issue in order just to analyze this thing, what you are going to, to reach, what are the results they want to, to appear or to reveal, which means that we have the logic framework, maybe the objectives or the outcomes, immediate, whatever, or output, maybe a mid-term review, whatever, if you have it, which is the, uh, in the, during the implementation of the project. So once that you have these keywords, the keywords that you have, which is uh, quantitative results, percentages and uh, coherence and uh, regressions and something like that. And that will lead to something that there is a relation for, for example, there is a relationship between something and the other, X and Y. In the, in the, in the, in the other side, when you have this question, which is the outcome, whatever, that if this is something that will affect the other, you can see what are the opinions uh, through the KIIs and Fox groups. And you know, the qualitative mostly, which is just percentages and uh, frequencies. Not, not, you don't have too much about, which is more that depth in analysis somehow. So you can agree on uh, quantitative, the, the percentage they, they said that one with satisfaction maybe, and then the qualitative, they have their opinions, values, perceptions, whatever, that they are also uh, satisfaction. What is the cross-cutting of the quantitative qualitative is that the outcome or the objective that you are investigate in. This is the combined, which is me, which is the research or the soul of research and monitor and evaluation. Sorry for the long yeah. <laughs> this, no, that this, is this, very thank you. relevant. Yeah, thank you so much for adding that detail. Um, it's always, when you do a webinar, it's always interesting to see how people draw you into different topics and you could do a whole <laughs> other webinar on that. <laughs> thank but you thank very you. much. No, that was very well said, thank you. Okay, George and then Agnes. 
we we only have two minutes so i'll take this last two and maybe i can uh, request to know from the hosts how do we take any other outstanding questions or how do we uh, continue the conversation well i think you can take um two more questions then we wrap up all right um, so that uh, we make sure everybody's happy and satisfied yeah yeah so i'm not sure if george can hear me or agnes can hear me there's somebody who's trying to talk, but they, their name is Galaxy. Please rename your Zoom account. <laughs> we all want to be safe. <laughs> okay, so I'm not seeing, um, not seeing whether this, okay. It looks like they lower their hands. Let's just, just take two more then. Fatima, welcome, and then Yusuf. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm Fatima Adam from Somalia. The question I'm asking is uh, what are the major challenges for combining a research methodology of qualitative and quantitative data? Yeah, good question. So if, you, if you're talking about challenges of mixed approaches, so you know combining is where we talk about mixed methods research. So the major challenge uh, would be if you do not understand each one deeply. That would be the major, most major challenge of mixed methods. So many people who are attempting mixed methods and the speaker who just explained earlier did a wonderful job of, of showing how exactly to analyze the data. So if you actually don't know what quantitative is and what qualitative is, and you're trying to combine the two, then that's going to present a challenge because you will not have a skill in actually analyzing mixed methods. Remember we said you can do it convergent or sequentially. So mm -hmm. I would say that's one of the major challenges. Then the other one is perhaps um, understanding which method to use, which mm -hmm. mixed method, mix, mixed method has, has many, many types of mixed methods. Which mixed method approach is best for your study question? Is it a qualitative dominant mixed method, a quantitative dominant mixed method? So again, um, uh, Cresswell, has a lot of uh, writing on this. And uh, you can actually see also from the presentation I shared in the chat, a few more challenges and how to also overcome them. I hope I've answered you. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so let's have the last question. Are you able to unmute? Mm, let's see, oh, the hand went down, okay. okay. I'm not sure. If, okay. Was you or the Lord? Welcome. Hello. Yes, madam. How are you? Fine, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, though I don't have that much questions, but my, my question is uh, when you are doing the, the research, mm -hmm. mostly the places that we, particularly I'm from Kenya, but currently I'm in Somalia. Okay. Uh, sometimes back I wanted to do the smart safe for save the mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. but the the problem is the the smart safe and the qualitative and qualitative and qualitative safe. What is the difference by, by that much? Because some questions they ask me I didn't understand for them. Mm. So please can you shade for me more light for that place? Okay, is Smart Survey a software? Is it a tool? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we are using the, 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 the survey was the, particularly was uh, focusing on the uh, malnutrition and dot force food in some area of the Somalia. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think that, uh, I think I've heard of that as a tool. Um, and it, it is for rapid assessment of acute emergencies, like uh, if you want to get nutrition data under certain context. But I'm not too sure about um, its applicability in whether it is mostly quantitative, qualitative. I'm not sure. I haven't interacted with Smart Survey very closely as a software. So I'm sorry, I don't have the answer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But usually, for a good question, if you keep asking, you'll get the answer. 
Somebody will yes. be able to tell you the methodologies it uses and things like that. You can also Google, you can ask the company, you can actually contact the company which created the software and ask them about the different ways you can use it as a researcher. Okay. All right, thanks. I know there's so many more questions and comments, but I think I'll give it back to the moderator now. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Joyce, I think with regard to that question, maybe for others, Okay. It would be good if you can define uh, the difference between quantitative and qualitative. I think that's uh, very, very important. Okay, I see. Yes. I see. Okay. So uh, quantitative versus qualitative research, and I had alluded to it a lot in my presentation, uh, are two, the two dominant types of you know, research or also data collection methods, or we can also say research design. So what is the difference? Their main difference is that quantitative studies rely on numerical or measurable data. But in contrast, qualitative studies rely on personal accounts, please mute, or documents that illustrate in detail how people think or respond. So we'll talk about stories when you talk about qualitative data, words, meanings, perceptions, okay? But quantitative allow you to see patterns of data, you know, when you do a tabulation and you can actually see very, very distinct, uh, you know, statistical analysis. So those are some of the differences between qualitative and quantitative. So quantitative numbers and statistics, qualitative what the meaning. So in quantitative, you measure variables, you test hypotheses, and in qualitative, you explore concepts, you, uh, you, you unveil experiences in more detail. Right. Thank you for that. All right. Um, thank you very much. If there's no other question, I think then we can wind up. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Joyce Ngogi for the wonderful presentation. I'm sure we've all learned a lot. Um, we will continue. Um, looks like there are lots of opportunities for having more webinars. So I'll be discussing with her uh, to agree on which other area, then we can have another session, uh, strengthening monitoring and evaluation because m and checks the difference. Uh, businesses check profits, but uh, projects uh, we use m and to check the difference we are making in uh, different uh, communities. So Joyce, uh, we'll, we'll discuss um, uh, how we can come up with another session probably next month. And I would like to thank our global community for the participation. It's been very, very, uh, very, very interactive. We've learned a lot. So thank you very much. Tomorrow, we will have uh, this recording on our YouTube channel. And our YouTube channel is uh, Strategia Netherlands. Uh, there are about uh, 55 other videos there on monitoring and evaluation, project management, proposal writing, water and sanitation. So this recording will be uh, on the channels. Uh, please subscribe and um, you'll be notified uh, when we upload um, uh, the video. Finally, um, in the last uh, session, we uh, that was in November, we uh, gave a scholarship to uh, the first person who did a summary of uh, what they had learned from the workshop, the, uh, from the session. The session was on participatory monitoring and evaluation, and we were giving an award for postgraduate diploma in monitoring and evaluation to Miriam Chitulu. Is Miriam Chitulu in? If you are in, please raise your hand. And if you are not in, then uh, that opportunity would give it to Dan Adipo. I hope Dan Adipo is in. So uh, is Dan Adipo in? Um, so send in an email immediately to info at strategianetherlands.nl and then we'll guide you on how uh, you can uh, join the course. And also, again, from this session, um, send us a summary of what you've learned. The first person who sends a beautiful summary on what they've learned from this session will give them a scholarship to take a course on monitoring and evaluation uh, starting uh, uh, tomorrow or the, the day after. So thank you very much, everyone. I uh, want to thank you. And... Uh, God bless you. And uh, let's keep in touch. And we'll keep updating you on uh, what's happening. So to everyone, thank you very much and have a good day, good evening, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you so much.
All right. Regina? Oh, dear. Thank you. 